a sort of uh, to introduce the speaker. Glenn is one of the latest recruits to the Socialist Party. I'm pleased to say, <coughs> um, and hope that uh, his time as a member will be of great contribution to the organisation. Just a, a one or two personal notes. We don't usually go in for personality things, but, but I'll say this nevertheless. Um, just to give you some sort of flavour and background of Glenn as the speaker tonight. He's been engaged in all sorts of expeditions and is a, an experienced mountaineer. He includes the world's first unsupported crossing of Spitsbergen and the first British crossing of Greenland, taking the route used by the great Norwegian explorer Nansen. Nansen. He's also canoed the full length of Canada's longest river, the Mackenzie. He's a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and a member of the Climbers Club and Arctic Club. Can I introduce Glenn Morris, who will speak on business growth in conflict with the environment. Glenn. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming out on this very hot day to hear this. And um, I gave this title in, in perhaps rather naively, but uh, I did hear through the grapevine that there was a few sort of raised eyebrows as if to say, well, <coughs> You know, am I, by giving it this type, assuming that business growth is, in fact, a necessary requirement in society? But I hope that that will be, that myth will be put to rest very soon. Um, I am, as David said, new to the party, and my knowledge of uh, politics is, is very limited. And I know that I'm amongst people here that are considerably more uh, eloquent than I am on the subject of socialism. So you'll have to forgive me if some of my arguments and thoughts to you may sound a little simplistic, but nevertheless, they are based on my personal experience and my thoughts um, on our society have, have moved over my years and have come round to where I am now. Um, as I'll tell you about, I actually do run a business myself, and uh, uh, the business employs 23 people. And as a result of running that business, it's become more and more apparent to me. Um, how it is absolutely, absolutely impossible to run a, a business, if you like, or a, a group of workers in a manner that is commensurate with their good health, well-being, and indeed the well-being of the environment. And I'll come on to that later. I won't be too long talking because I don't want to be too tedious for you. But um, what I hope to do is show you a few pictures. Um, <coughs> this will, I think. I've chosen them carefully. I didn't really want this to be a great long slideshow or anything, so there are only a few images, but I hope each one will give you a clue as to some of the points I'm trying to make. One belief I have, and I'm sure that's shared by most people here, is that uh, under the system we currently uh, suffer under, let's put it that way, under capitalism, the destruction, destruction of the environment is, is actually a necessary byproduct. It's not as if it's something that's sort of an unfortunate byproduct. It is actually necessary, and the way capitalism, capitalism operates requires the destruction of the environment, and indeed, dare I say it, you know, human beings as well. And I think this hopefully will also become obvious to you. Most of you, I'm sure, know that. Um, I'm sure also that those of you who listen to the news and uh, repapers and so on and so forth, will be familiar with some of the things that are obviously facing us. All the time these things are out there facing us. And to me, in my simplistic way, it always seems so obvious, and I can't understand why so many people aren't filling this room, so many people aren't fighting for the cause of socialism. I, I struggle with that one a lot. Um, I'll come on to why I think that is later. And examples of the things that are obviously facing us, you, you've probably heard of the company called Trapigura. Um, this is a company that I had some information that I was going to print for you, which I can still do, and I'll probably send it to David. Um, but it's a company that were trying to get rid of some nasty chemicals, basically. And what they ended up doing is taking, believe it or not, the cheapest option and dumping it on the coast of Africa, and thereby poisoning, effectively, uh, African uh, citizens on the coast of Africa. Typical example. My own experience of talking, to, um, traveling in the Arctic, I've talked to many, many scientists in the Arctic and come across a lot of people um, in airports, in all 
conveyor situations, particularly through the Northwest Passage in the Arctic, and those of you that are familiar with geography will know that that was the, the route that goes across and through Canada's archipelago of islands. And it was originally a route that was, believe it or not, used for, um, with the view to trying to create a commercial conduit, as it were, without having to go south. So they were trying to get all the valuables from that part of the world through another way, because it was cheaper, of course. And in, the, in doing so, a lot of the explorers died in the, in, in the cause. Nevertheless, I've spoken to scientists and people working in that area, and it is clear to me that there's an awful lot of mining going on in the Arctic. A huge amount of mining. There's diamonds, there's chemicals, and there's oil, of course. And I spoke to a lady in an airport, is one lady who's been t her job is to cover all of this northern part of Canada, um, and that includes Nunavut and um, uh, what used to be the Northwest Territories up there, Nunavut and uh, Alaska and those areas. And what she does is she visits mines and she tells them when she's going. She turns up there and she inspects their processes and systems for disposing of the byproducts of their activities. Most of these byproducts are highly, highly toxic. And she says, some mines are okay, some mines are dreadful. And I said, well, tell me what happens, what happens? And basically, they sort of look out, as soon as she's gone, into the rivers, this thing goes, instead of being processed properly. It literally is thrown out onto the land. So there you've got a situation where to conduct their business in competition with the other mine down the road, as it were, they have to think of the cheapest means possible of disposing of their toxic chemicals. So clearly, the top priority there is not the environment and not people. Now, taken further, okay, the environment is extremely bad news, and in Fort Chippewan, which is also in the uh, northern uh, uh, part of Canada, where uh, First Nation people live, there are small voice on the world stage, the Inuit and First Nation people, and they don't have a lot of clout. There's not many of them. It's not like it's happening in the middle of London. And as a result of the, I believe this particular one is, is a result of a lot of the tar sands and things that are going on up there. You've probably heard of this. All sorts of carcinogens are being thrown into the rivers in other parts of the world because it's a much cheaper way of getting rid of the stuff and keeps it all competitive. As a result of that, the fish are becoming um, contaminated and some of the First Nation people living in Port Chip, as it's called, are dying of cancers. And there's an astonishing number of cancers in a very small community. There is a doctor there, a white doctor from Southern Canada, who's trying to do something about it, and he's basically having the Canadian Health Authority on his back saying, you're out, you made too much fuss. This is the sort of thing that's going on all the time. And I won't expand on all these things, because frankly, anyone can look at the internet and pluck these things out wherever you look. And what worries me and upsets me so much is it's, it's so obvious that we are putting, I say we, I use that word hesitantly, but society puts um, profit before uh, the well-being of the environment. China is another one. We all know about that. And the moment China's rivers have for thousands and thousands of years have been the source of food, what, uh, somewhere for the communities to live and wash and so on and so forth, are running like tox toxins now. And uh, that's the price for China's growth. The other thing that is, I heard on the news recently, although it was to be expected, of course, was this um, great saviour of the human food problem, GM crops. It was hailed as being a fantastic thing. It's going to be wonderful. You know, we're going to be able to grow crops in drought situations, awkward situations. It's an absolute necessity for to feed the world. Well, most of you here, as, as I said, more knowledgeable means uh, in terms of socialism and everything else, we know that that's an absolute myth. The reason, of course, that uh, the GM is being so heavily pushed is because there are huge profits to be made on seed patents. And they're poor farmers, and they are poor, they're living in these various backwaters of the world, if you like, um, will be forced to grow these seeds and will only be able to buy those seeds. And of course, they can't then collect the seeds from the plant afterwards and carry on growing it, finished. They have to buy more. They are forced to buy more. And this is, in my view, absolutely criminal. But I'm afraid that's what goes on. And um, Monsanto and people like that, I'll talk about them later, um, are probably a prime example of those sorts of uh, companies. Massive, massive.
massive companies that put people set and therefore the environment. Coming, that's not just talking about the environment, incidentally, when I'm talking about GM crops. There is an, the other damage to the environment is a monoculture. When you've got a GM crop or any monoculture, I work with trees and I'll come into that data, that's my job. I even run a, a small arboricultural company. And you've probably seen people swinging about on ropes in trees, that's what I do. Um, <coughs> the fact is, I know, uh, and ye years ago in the 1930s, they had the street beautification scheme. And you probably know if you've driven through the suburbs of London, you've seen hunting streets with loads of pink, sort of candy boss trees all down the sides. Those trees are called Prunus Kanzan. And when you've got so many of one tree, if you get a disease that hits that tree, it hits the lot, you know, and they all go. So there is a price to be paid for this monoculture. And there was something on the news the other day, forgive me, I can't remember when, but it was basically, um, there was a lady scientist arguing against GM crops and saying, that it's way more successful when you have a diversity of crops. And in fact, they are more successful in dealing with all the various problems that uh, ensue when you have a warming temperature and so on. So it's a myth, is what I'm suggesting to you. Now, the problem that I have as well is when one tries to put the cause for socialism, um, and I think in a way the problem is demonstrated by the fact that we've got some people here that are obviously very dedicated to the cause, and you look out of the window, there are hundreds of people looking by just as we're talking now, so what is it that is the problem? And I think it's rather like religion. When I talk to people, and I have that many, many times, lots of, some friends of mine, I have their various religi religious convictions. When you talk to them, their bottom line is, their end answer is, oh, you must have faith. That is the final answer they have. They have not got anything beyond that. That is where you stop with the argument when you talk about religion with people. I have to say, I have a lot of sympathies and a lot of areas of different religions, be it Buddhism, Jehovah's Witnesses, or church people, whoever it is. I think an awful lot of them do good things. And in, in a way, you could argue, they're proving that humanity isn't innately unpleasant. They do do good things. The bottom, where I fail to work for company is where they get to the end and they say, oh, you've got to have faith because you've got to believe in this God or whatever it happens to be. And I think socialists have the same sort of problem because where, where they meet up with a similar sort of argument, it's not quite faith. It's an argument where these uh, people, less than that here, are walking by having a great time in the sun. They genuinely believe, and I don't want to sound patronising, I'm not being patronising, I wish they'd come in and we could convince them otherwise. But I do believe that they genuinely believe that there is no other way. You know, this is how it is and how it's always got to be. And that also I struggle with because I think we come to the point in society now where the problems of society are becoming so obvious to people that they're all struggling with how they can deal with it and they're trying to deal with these problems within this system. And therein lies the problem. People ideally, I think, should be able to view a system, a new system, a new way of living. After all, there have been others. It's not as if this has been the only one. You know, we've had hunter gatherers, we've had feudalism, we've had sort of, if you like, a sort of mini war capitalism. Now we've got globalization, or after that, there has to be something that's front. Often I talk to people, and this sort of thing comes out. Yesterday I was invited to a lunch to present an environmental <coughs> prize in Kent. And um, it's the usual sort of gothic people who turned up there, but um, I was next to a lady who's worked Kent County Council, and her job was to deal with policies on food security. And I couldn't quite figure out in Kent what that meant, but in, in essence, Kent grows an awful lot of an awful lot of potatoes, but she's quite puzzled because she couldn't understand why they're bringing so much food and veg in from elsewhere in the world. And she's telling me that it's, it's terrible because you know there's these ancient aquifers in part of Africa where they are now to make more profit draining these aquifers. They're sucking this water out of these ancient aqu aquifers that will never be replaced. It will, once it's out, it's finished and gone. And they're putting the water effectively into the crops and then shipping them over here. And I said, well, why do they do it? She said, well, it's, it's, it just makes more profit. And there you are, there's someone who's not a socialist who's giving you the answer, but not quite making the link. And I find that with a lot of people, they almost give you the answer. When you tease them out, tease it out, they give you the answer. They say, well, it's just because profit's put first. And, and you, then you struggle because then if you then try and suggest a socialist case, 
they can't, they, then they go all blank and they can't quite uh, get their heads around it. I also spoke recently to a, a, a young woman who I was rock climbing with, um, she's part of a group, and she's about 23. And I don't know how we got onto the subject, it wasn't how, how you might think I got on the subject, but we were talking about babies. And um, she said, I'm definitely not having children, I just think the world's too dangerous. And this is a 23 year old woman. And personally, I think that's um, you know, quite a disturbing uh, way of looking at things. And I, I, it's worrying, I think, that young people now are beginning to almost accept that it's a terrible situation, but feel impotent against it. The Prince's Trust did some studies uh, last year, and uh, it was found that something like 25% of young people feel clinically de or are clinically depressed, and something like 10 percent feel like there's no point in living anymore. Now, I don't know how you feel about this. I think this is, these are dreadful statistics. I won't go into too many statistics because I think well, I haven't got them in my head, that's why. Now, um, the other thing when one is dealing with people who believe in this current society, if you like, is this idea that we are somehow to blame. And, and, and this, this word bothers me. It's used an awful lot in... Uh, um, articles or when people are talking about problems, they're saying, well, we take too much, we do this wrong, we do that wrong. And they constantly fail to realise that it's nothing to do with individual people. It's the arrangement of our society. It's not we as individuals, but it's an extremely useful tool for politicians to use. Because if they can get people to believe that, you know, we are greedy, we have got to cut down more. And after all, let's face it, we're often referred to as ordinary people. We're often referred to as consumers, and, and that's something that really bugs me. But um, it, it's almost an insult to call someone a consumer. If they're sort of like some huge machine that is sucking the goodness of the world and it can't be stopped. Right, I'm waffling on quite a lot, so I'd like to get onto some pictures. Um, and But before I do, actually, I'm just going to read you briefly. Jacqueline kindly gave me this. It's a very thoughtful lady, and she sort of pick this up. Now this is a socialist standard from June 1975 and this actually sort of says a lot of things I wanted to say so I think time will allow me just to read a bit of this to you. Now this is over a quarter of a century ago and I think those of you here that aren't socialists will begin to understand that socialism as a cause is not one that moulds itself to current thinking, it's a cause that has existed unchanged for many many years and also, the problems that it addresses and refers to have also existed at that time. Anyway, a continual obstacle to socialism, socialism has always been the alleged urgency of things which people say must be seen to first. The crisis, whichever one it is, the threat or the actuality of war, the oppression of particular groups and particular social grievances. In the last 20 years, this prior attention field has been held by first, the nuclear disarmament movement, and since, the environmentalists. It is difficult for socialists not to feel irritated because, of the, because the urgency is the mark of non-comprehension of what the problem is about. And I think that's something that I'm going to try and address in a minute. The environment, in inverted commas, has been the great discovery of the past decade. It has been treated as if it has actually were a territorial discovery, that is, made a colony at once, with a government department to supervise its affairs and the capitalist class looking for ways to make a profit from it. The discoverers themselves have lectured on their finds and warned incessantly of the dangers from this dark continent. The socialist analysis of the world made the world made environment paramount long before it gained this popular currency. For us, it means the influence of the structure of society, which includes man's relationship with nature. For environmentalists, it means putting that relationship on a separate footing to which society is expected to adjust if a good enough or feel, fearful enough case is made. I'm sure you can see the parallels here. What this comes to in practice is seeking social reforms and making demands for which there is no hope of fulfilment within the capitalist system. Can you see there how they are observing hopefully exactly what I'm trying to say here? And within this system, you can expect environmental damage to be catastrophic and ongoing. I'll continue. As an example, the environmentalists have attacked economic growth as an antithetical to human well-being. Now a crisis involving inflation, 
trade depression and large-scale unemployment, this was in the mid-70s, has caused growth to run down. How many of them will say they want, this is what they wanted? One more brief thing. Another header, uh, beginning of an article here. Long before pollution became a popular cause and ecology a fashionable term, the socialist indictment of capitalism included the waste that is inseparable from market production. A minority in society own the means for production, that is the land, raw materials, factories, communications, and so on. Through this ownership, they are able to buy from the majority, the working class, their working ability. So you can see nothing much has changed. This is an article from the Daily Telegraph that they highlighted that was printed in 11th of July, 74. And they're talking about Poland. Contamination here is about twice the level normally tolerated in Poland, or for that matter, in the West. Again, a hundred miles east of Warsaw, I saw trees destroyed or badly damaged for 20 miles by nitrogenous fumes from a huge fertilizer plant. That's ironic, isn't it? Anyway, so I won't thank you, Jacqueline, but it just goes to show that the cause of socialism hasn't changed, but unfortunately it seems that people still are not getting the message and seeing this current society as the problem. I'm going to move on now. I told you I work with trees, and um, this is an old tree, and what it says to me is that these are wonderful organisms, and I love trees, but maybe you guys can't see these here. So why don't you move around in the room? Well, you're, you're still one. Well, they me to work um, okay. There we are. You can't see this here. This tree here is in a famous wood called Mockers Wood, which is uh, in, near Hereford. And uh, this wood was frequented by one of the Victorian writers, uh, Francis, uh, Re Reverend, that's it, Francis Kilbert, who used to write about these trees and think of them as ancient men who sort of seen the passage of time. Now, I know that that tree looks like that now, and it looked like that pretty much before I was born, and probably before anyone here was born, and probably 150 years ago it looked like that. But there are changes taking place um, that are affecting our trees as well, sadly. Now, I just like to use this, I'm going to work around trees, so I work with trees now, economic growth. We talked about the, the problems of this, and um, the things, the damage as a result of so-called economic or business growth. But a tree will grow. But let's look at what it does when it grows. When it grows, its leaves are constantly shed. So it's providing food and nutrients to the ground around it. It's growing compost. It provides shade for wildlife. It provides a habitat for wildlife. And even when it finally gives over and falls over, it decomposes and gives back what, what it's taken, if you like, from, from its environment. So it's quite a good example of something that grows without having to destroy it in the process. Now, I put this in, it didn't make it quite a funny slide to put in, but it occurred to me that when you buy a chair, perhaps you, one, those of you who aren't familiar with socialism might think of when you buy a chair, why is that being sold to you, if you like? What's it, well, more to the point, what is it made for? That sounds like a dark question. You may think, well, the, the chair is made to sit on. Sadly, the reality is it is it's made to be sold, and more, moreover, it's made to be sold at a profit. If you want a chair these days, you don't go to the, a person that makes chairs and discuss how you want that chair made, and it's made for you in the design you want. The reality is you have a limited choice, actually. And you go to somewhere where they've got countless hundreds of chairs. They're probably made with what's known as a built-in obsolescence, so they will break up. They're not made to last. They're made so they will self-destruct. And sadly, as a result of that, these companies that make all these chairs and then give you loads of advertising having sold your chairs, saying, well, actually, you can't let one away, we've just got a new design, why don't you buy this one, it's even better. Obviously, that has an impact on the environment. As these companies are growing, they're thinking, well, hang on, we can't have not enough sustainable wood in the UK. Okay, let's go over to Malaysia. We're not going to cure their trees, we're going to be cheaper. And of course, see how all these big businesses grow, um, uh, the damage to the environment follows. Now, I've spent a long time living through with the Inuit in Ar the Arctic, and I'm not going to dwell on that here because it's not appropriate or necessary, but one interesting thing about hunter-gatherers, if you like, is that they had essentially no possessions other than a few useful things. They have a, a decent fishing net, probably, they have a good knife, 
and the basic stuff they needed for their lives it was, could sit on this sledge. And of course, we've moved on from that now. Uh, we've moved on, so I say we, so let's say society again, when it's imbued in people that they need huge amounts of possessions. And not only do they need so huge amounts of possessions, they are encouraged incessantly to change those possessions and buy new ones. So what happens to the environment? They have to get rid of them. So they're put in landfill, they're disposed of often in a poor way, and therefore the environment suffers as we know, with landfill and all the other problems that we're seeing. Incidentally, when the uh, early explorers gave these hunters, um, this is a friend of mine, incidentally, who lives in northern Canada, and I travelled with him last year, but when the early explorers gave these hunters things that they thought they'd like, they just leave them behind. They wouldn't even take them with them. They just had basically what they need. Now, talking to these people up in this part of the world, let's get back to business and the environment again. At the moment, the Northwest Passage is melting, and it's melting fast. And when I was there in 2008, that was the first year ever it's been entirely navigable by ships, the Northwest Passage. And bear in mind, countless explorers years ago died in the ice when it froze the ships in. So, it's now open. And what's happening? Okay, the Americans are going, yippee, if the permafrost is melting, we can drill some more oil. They don't make the connection. That, that is the problem in the first place. What is happening as well, um, and I've talked to scientists, this is personal experience, I'm telling you now. I've talked to many scientists who told me that bears, and I've seen it myself actually, bears are migrating further north. The caribou are, are having their um, migration routes disrupted by activity of mines um, and so on and so forth. These people that have spent countless thousands of years travelling on this land would have taken dog sledges across the ice, rather like this. This is uh, north of Baffin Island. And suddenly they find an icebreaker for crashing food to get to a, I don't know, mining camp or something. And they can't, they can't cross. So, and nor can the caribou. So the environment in these parts of the world is being dramatically um, affected by big business expansion. Now, at one point, um, we were on a, a long kayaking journey, um, and we stopped in a small community called Umimaktok, and that is at the head of the Bathurst Inlet in Canada. And this was, you know, the idea that people are inherently selfish and covetous and everything else was, uh, is a complete nonsense in my view. We turned up in the middle of the night, freezing cold, and uh, this Steve, my companion, and myself, and th this community was basically these people, there weren't any more people living in this very small Inuit community. And they turned out in the middle of the night, it was dark, cold and wet, and they welcomed into their houses, they all came to life and they gave us bannock and um, caribou to eat and coffee. And we had a fantastic time with them. Now, this I believe shows that people are inherently kind, they're thoughtful, they look after their fellow human beings. They are not, as a lot of politicians I suspect would have us believe, inherently covetous, nasty, want to grab everything you've got. People I do not believe are like that. And I think it's a very useful tool um, for certain politicians to use to suggest they are, because all the time you believe they are, you'll want to hang on to this stuff and keep running the system. But if you can believe that humans are inherently kind, you move on a step. Now, there's a further point to be made here. Because this is a small community, it is not considered by the Canadian government to be economically viable. This lady had certain medical needs. Now that meant that they occasionally had to fly a helicopter in to take her to hospital to look after her. Now, they didn't want to do that anymore. So they're almost forcing the closure of this community and forcing these people to move somewhere, somewhere else. Because if they're near a bigger town, you know, it's cheaper for them to deal with the medical requirements of the elderly people, but they will absolutely have no problem flying this stuff around. And they fly this all over the Arctic. And now what is this? It's crap, basically. And that is sugary water. That is all that is. Very, very heavy sugary water. That pallet probably weighs five times that old lady that you saw in that previous slide, at least. Okay? Now the other thing is, it's a known fact in the Arctic that children's teeth are rotting and their health is going to pot. But they continue to sell them this stuff, particularly that, and it's ruining their teeth because these are children who come from the culture of meat eating. 
thing. They're not used to this rubbish. And they've been fed it over the last 20 or 30 years, if that. And of course, these companies make a fortune of selling it because the poor children, bless them, are addicted now to the sugar and the fats and the salts that are contained in here. And you can see they're held something. I've seen it. And on the subject of children up in this part of the world, the Arctic is not this sort of wonderful uh, Nanook of the North smiling Eskimo scenario, I'm afraid. It's, um, it's nothing like that at all. And I stayed with a teacher in the north of Pond Inlet. And while I was talking to this teacher, I said, well, you know, how many children do you have in your class? It's a very small town, a tiny town. And he said, I have 30. And I used to teach at one time. And I said, can't get this big class, 30. He said, yeah, but they're never 30 there because, you know, they're all out sort of sniffing blue, getting drunk or whatever they're doing. And I said, well, how many do you have there? So, 10 if I'm lucky, and most of it's five regulars. So at that point, the teaching sounded easier. But, you know, the fact is, he also told me that in one year, eight children in a very small community committed suicide. So that is what we're driving these young people towards at the moment. Now, the environment is something I think um, people and society, not people, I must avoid that, society is through no fault of its own because of our system, is losing, um, the environment is losing touch with society, or society is losing touch with the environment. I took this near my house, and I have to say, something like this, this is, as you know, it's honey cycle, it, it is, it's, it's so pleasurable to sort of walk past, past something like that and smell it. You don't need to, you know, it's not like you need to um, buy it. It's there in the hedgerow for you to enjoy. And I feel quite sad that we're almost, as a society, being encouraged away from this. Now, years ago, in the early 60s, there was a lady that some of you probably have heard of, and she, she was around at the time that this book came out by Helia. And in that book, you've got countless pages of chemicals that you can use to treat weeds in your garden. And that was the sort of time when that was considered okay. But also at that time, 62, I think it was, Rachel Carson wrote the Seminole Silent Spring book. Sadly, she died of cancer. Um, but she was basically exposing these big chemical companies that made vast profits out of spraying the American highways and getting rid of weeds left, right, and center not realising that all this stuff that grows on the side of the Melbourne highways, or indeed any highway, is wonderful for wildlife and all the things that we know it for. So the point I'm making, I suppose, here is that that problem existed then. Monsanto, huge company, tried to destroy this woman. They absolutely pulled out all the stocks and tried to literally destroy her. But because her science was so good, she put up a hell of a fight and she did actually win through and get some control over some of the chemicals that we used. Even in my own company, my own tree company, until recently we used to use a, um, a chemical called um, sodium sulfamate for killing stumps. And our guys would go out and drill holes and put this stuff in. And invariably they threw up or came back sick. And if you got so much of the grain on this stuff on your hands, you would feel as sick as a dog. Uh, Anside was the trade name for it, and now it's been banned, which is good, but I'm sure they're still trying to find another, another chemical that they can say. Right, this is um, another Arctic picture, I'm afraid, but this is, um, David mentioned, canoeing the Mackenzie River. And this was near the end of the Mackenzie River, and I always take pictures of trees when I see them. And I spoke to some uh, First Nation people li living near here, and it was a very interesting conflict. And they're about to put a pipeline down the Mackenzie River, which means the destruction of lots of hunting and trapping lines, and indeed the entire change of the way people live here. And it's a very interesting conflict of opinions. What you find is some of them will say, great, it's great because it's going to bring jobs, lift the economy, more jobs, more money, and they saw that as good. And others, 50% of them, were totally against it because they saw it as being the end of their culture and the end of the way they had always lived. Now, this picture is, is not, you know, uh, some horrible place in, uh, I don't know, in Europe or somewhere. This is Greenland. And as a result of packaging, which is something that you're all very familiar with, we are constantly made to buy one avocado over another by having six or seven different types of packaging on it to try and make it look more appealing. 
That packaging is not to protect the fruit. Whenever you see packaging, it's got nothing to do with what's inside other than to try and make you buy it. But the end result of this plastic that's being produced by society is it generally ends up somewhere else. And I remember when I did chemistry at school, my chemistry teacher said, this is great, this plastic, and he showed us how to make it. He said, the problem is you never get rid of it. And of course, we now know that in the Pacific, there's an area the size of Texas, two or three meters deep of solid plastic at the moment in the big Pacific eddy. And there's 146,000 pieces of plastic in every square mile of the world's oceans. And I've kayaked thousands of miles around Greenland and the Arctic, and I've often haven't seen it. You see it all around the edges, but not always on the water. So if you think, well, that can't be true. It's not on the water. It's, I mean, in the water. It exists in the water. So I put this in just because I thought it was quite amusing. I mean, talking about packaging, trying to sell you things. Near where I live, there's a huge, great shopping uh, extravaganza called Blue Water. You may have heard of it. And um, I thought, well, in there you've got the sort of little thing to tell you where all the shops are and everything. And then it says there, it just says everything, doesn't it, really? Buying someone for someone who has everything. Well, if you've got everything, why do you want to buy them anything? <laughs> it says, why not treat them to a late side gift size, uh, gift cards? I mean, it's such a nonsense. <laughs> and there we are, that's what we're faced with. Um, I mentioned our loss of connection with the environment. Um, and I'll come back to trees again. Once again, this is a bluebell wood. And a, took a picture of it last year because it, you know, it looked so well, beautiful, really. And I think there is so much pleasure to be had for the environment. And I think if society did change, we would find much more time to engage with that environment. And we would begin to feel that you know our time was, was more valuable. We wouldn't have to tear around like maniacs all the time. We do have a lot there with coal, unfortunately. Um, sadly, um, I know any of you have heard of these transition towns. I'm afraid I got into a bit of an argument with someone who's sort of the head of a transition town. And um, he was actually quite unpleasant to me because um, I was saying that that wasn't the answer. And of course, in his mind, he thought it was, it, it was the absolute answer. But we all know, I hope, that ultimately would work for the reason that everything else doesn't work. It cannot work unless everything changes. And BP, I heard on the news the other day that uh, the reason they've done that pipeline, um, that oil drill the way it was, is because it was cheaper. There was also an employee who flagged up a problem with it. But because, like a lot of employees who whistleblow and everything else, um, you know, he was shut up and put around the corner somewhere, so no one would hear, and then what happens? We all know. Years ago, the Inuit would have hunted in kayaks. And those kayaks would have been either remade, reused, or rotted back into the ground. And they now use motor boats like this. And uh, no doubt Yamaha, Yamaha think it's fantastic to sell on as many of these as they can, not realizing they just get dumped on the land afterwards. <coughs> we are having a fantastic loss of primary forests at the moment. I'm sure you all know about this. I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, you all know about the Amazon. but. Um, one, one word that wasn't said by me was Andrew Mitchell, who's the president of the uh, World Canopy Organization, uh, which is in, involved in the preservation of rainforests, said on Radio 4 that the Amazon rainforest is worth more cut down than it is standing. And of course, what, what do you mean by worth? And we all know what he meant by worth. Now, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about my experience as a, a director of a company. We, we've got 23 guys working with us. We all get on really well. They work astonishingly hard. Tree surgery is probably outside of mining and all those heavy, heavy jobs. One of the toughest jobs there is to do. It's a very physical, hard job. These, these guys work very, very hard indeed. But constantly, we are in conflict with the environment. If you are, we are expected, as far as I know as a limited company, we, are, we would be breaking the law if we didn't make a profit. Now that's straight away you can see the constraints that puts on you when you're running a business. We are obliged to provide these guys with safety equipment, which of course is good and proper and right. But the reality is that if there's a tight time, like a recession, you, it's much harder to go out and splash out on a load of new chainsaw trousers or safety boots or this, that and the other. And often in companies, that doesn't happen. 
So if it doesn't happen, something goes wrong, and it often may mean that that person may have an injury or, or suffer in some way. Hearing loss, let's say a simple example, we are obliged to use hearing protection with chainsaws. That might look all right, but the fact is the little rubber bits get worn out, and the, the noise of chainsaws, which is extreme, goes into their ears, and they suffer from ear damage. It's very easy for the manager to say, oh, that's all right, helmet loss, another couple of months, that's all right, no problem. Years down the line, that employee may well have really bad hearing damage and not actually be able to lose his or her hearing. So I don't have to expand on this, but you can see straight away how constantly we're clashing with that. So you can't really grow a business without someone, somewhere, or something suffering. The other thing, of course, is that, and this is a statistic I heard of recently, um, the people that make these chainsaws, a German company called um, Steel, and these are the chainsaws we commonly use, and there's one of our guys there. That's a little chainsaw we use in a tree. But chainsaws, interestingly, give out phenomenal amounts of carbon. And if you use a chainsaw for an hour, a medium-sized chainsaw, this may be hard to believe, but it's been peer -review, a peer-reviewed paper, it's the equivalent of driving something like 2,000 kilometers in an ordinary saloon car. So one hour's use of a chainsaw, equivalent of 2,000 kilometers in an ordinary saloon car. Uh, the, the PhD uh, professor I knew, know that did that study tried to contact Still and get some info, but they were very shady to work and remotely interested in giving them any further information on that. The other thing, of course, we do is we use these sorts of polypropylene ropes. The reality is, if we were environmentally friendly, people think there's a tree surgeon, ah, oh, fantastic job, you work with tree in the environment, that must, must be lovely. The reality is it isn't. We're all we're doing is destroying the environment. We're hacking trees about, to put it crudely. That's what we do. And why do we do it? So a developer can put in a new car park. Or someone's moaning because they've got an expensive car, the aphids in the tree are dripping honeydew from the tree onto their car. Okay, this is the sort of thing that happens, you know. I go up to these people and I knock on their door and they go, I want that bleeding tree down, it's dropping stuff all over me mother. You get a little lot of that sort of stuff, you know. And they, bless them, they don't, you know, they, they, they always start off with this, oh, I love trees, but, you know, um, you get an awful lot of that. The other, thing, of course, is that we are forced to work further afield than is ideal if you are working in sympathy with the environment. If we have to get a job and it's in Hastings, we'll drive 50 miles to Hastings to make the money. And therein lies a problem. You know, you're using loads of fuel, big diesel truck, hauling vast tonnages of wood up and down the highway. Years ago, of course, this didn't happen. What would have happened is people would have worked much more in, in harmony with the environment. They would have used hand tools. And of course their job was tough. We all know how tough things were. I mean, I'm not trying to make look at it in, through rose-tinted spectacles here. But nevertheless, there was qualities. There were qualities in as much as they were probably breathing much cleaner air. They were probably more in touch with the environment. They'd hear the blackbirds in the woods. They, they'd notice what was going on. They, they'd know about the phenology of plant growth. And they, they'd know the names of the plants which are tree surgeons don't, and they've got the head helmet on, you know, <laughs> fires are down, just, you know, that's, they just, with their inner thoughts. Will we please know this is the last slide? So, this is the planet we live on, and this photograph was taken by one of the Apollo astronauts in the early 70s, um, about the time, incidentally, when that article in the uh, magazine, The Standard, was written. And Edgar Mitchell, um, who was one of the Apollo astronauts, looked out at the Earth, and at that time, felt that it looked so beautiful and so fragile. And like a lot of the astronauts who walked on the Earth, and believe me, that must have been, an, sorry, walked on the moon, that must have been an astonishing thing to do. He looked back at that planet and he said, my God, what on Earth did we do, are we doing to it? Because he knew, even in the mid-70s, mid you had the environmental movement, you had the rainforest, the whales, you know, uh, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, it all existed in the 70s. He looked back and said, what on earth are we doing to it? And he said, what we need is a new world order. And I believe that is what we need. And I believe that it needs to be socialism. And that's the end. Thank you.